Hello, you're all trickling in now. I'm uh, Michael Moynihan. I'm the cultural news editor for Newsweek and the Daily Beast in New York. And I'm moderating this fantastic panel on an issue that when we discuss human rights is off, often sort of underserved and underappreciated. And the title of the panel is Facade Capitalism and Its Threat to Human Rights. So we're going to talk about economics. And it will be very sexy and fun, I promise you. But we are very crushed for time here, so I'm going to introduce our phenomenal panelists, um, starting with uh, Luke Harding, a former war correspondent and former Moscow correspondent for the Guardian newspaper. And Luke is going to tell us why he's the former correspondent. It's not because he decided to retire. Uh, and he's the author of a fantastic book called Mafia State, and those of you who have swag bags will have a copy of it. I urge you to read it. I have, and he'll be speaking on the same subject. Rafael Marcus de Morris is an Angolan civil rights activist and the director of Maka Angola, an anti-corruption organization in Luanda. He is going to be talking on the, uh, the topic of growing wealth, shrinking democracy, which is sort of pivoting off a very good uh, editorial that he wrote for the New York Times recently. Chi Soon Wan is uh, a Singaporean activist and leader of the opposition Singapore uh, Democracy Party. Uh, last year, this is the interesting, last year she was uh, prevented from uh, joining us here at the Oslo uh, Freedom Forum, and we are hugely lucky and thankful that he's here this year to discuss the myth of the benevolent dictator. It's a, it's a difficult myth to bust. Don Boudreau will be starting. And Don Boudreau is our economist. He is a professor of, of economics and a former chair of the econ department at George Mason University in Virginia. And he also holds the Getchell chair at the Mercatus Center. Uh, Don is the author of the uh, terrifically named book, Hypocrites and Halfwits. So I don't suspect Don will be pulling many punches here. And he'll be making the case for economic freedom. And he's going to be starting right now. Don. Well, thank all of you. That was four fantastic uh, talks. And I have the sort of unenviable task right now of taking four disparate talks on disparate subjects and sort of trying to tie them all together in a limited amount of time. The one thing that struck me about all this, the three countries we're talking about here, Singapore, Angola, Russia, are countries that have had massive economic growth, GDP growth. And so I'm going to start, I'm going to Put this to Don, who started, and you know, you're a classical liberal. The argument in the night was very common in the 1970s and 1980s that political freedom would be born out of either economic freedom or free trade. So, you know, if you have an authoritarian regime that does all the right things economically, freedom would follow. Now, we're talking about three countries here where that didn't happen or has not happened, China, another one. I know it's a huge question, but explain that to me, Tom. <laughs> well, I don't think you had genuine economic freedom. You can mimic the consequences of genuine economic freedom. You can generate measurable economic growth. We have these statistics that we conventionally measure, uh, investment, uh, GDP, uh, per capita GDP. Uh, much of this growth, I think, is, is uh, Potemkin Village kind, kinds of growth. It's, it's manufactured. It is... Uh, it, it's, it's the building of the symptoms of economic prosperity rather than building of the foundations of economic prosperity. And so I, I think in a lot of these cases, you don't have genuine economic freedom. You might have a modicum in, increase in it, but you don't have anything sufficient to, in my view, be called real freedom. You can get skyscrapers. You can get millionaires. Uh, you can get more MP3 players maybe on the streets of, of, of Singapore and Moscow and St. Petersburg. But that is insufficient evidence to me yep. that there has been real economic freedom. Yeah, uh, I'll put real economic freedom is more than, more than just, you know, just trade. Yeah. yeah, and I'll put this to Chi. I mean, we have a, a good example of this. I was mucking about on the Internet looking for things to write about, as I do. And I came across a headline... And Business Insider, which is you know a substantial website in the United States, in the headline, and this is to you, it's not even a question, but I suspect you'll react to this. And the headline was a blaring headline: Singapore is the ultimate beacon of economic freedom. That was the headline. It's not a beacon; it's the ultimate beacon. What what happens when you read something like that? No, I said a little while ago, uh, business businesses they love coming to Singapore. Mm -hmm. I mean everything is done very efficiently for them. The only problem is that 
um, without political freedom. Yeah. There is no market freedom. It, it, as I understand it, in the marketplace, you, you, there, is, there must be a bargain between labor and management in terms of even just wages. That doesn't exist in Singapore. I mean, we, we have an umbrella uh, trade union congress, and that's headed by a cabinet minister. So you can well imagine the, the situation that, that we find ourselves whilst um, businesses are free to do as they, they please and things, are, as I said, are made very efficiently uh, managed for them. Uh, there is this other section whereby there is no political freedom in Singapore as far as the people are concerned. So is it, I mean, is it the sense that when economic growth happens so rapidly in countries that don't have institutions or traditions of political freedom, it entrenches authoritarianism? And so, I mean, for instance, Raphael and I were, were talking uh, today, and he had an absolutely fascinating point uh, this morning. We are talking about uh, Portugal, former colonial holder, slave master of, of Angola. In this amazing flip, that has happened that in Portugal now, there are stores, Prada stores, yes. that are now open for Angolans, the former, you know, the, the, the slaves coming back in this way, and then, you know, opening it up to, to, I mean, tell us a little bit about this, you know, in Venezuela, they call them the Boli Bourgeoisie, this, old, this upper crust that is, you know, consuming all of the wealth. But that's the problem when we talk about market economy. It's not a real market economy in these countries. It's a kleptocracy. Yeah. What happened was with the transition to uh, market economy, government officials apportioned what was available for privatization and basically turned these companies into cartels. So we have only two uh, mobile cell phone operators, for instance, uh, and uh, those belong to the president's daughter and some influential generals, and uh, they set the prices. And it becomes also another form of economic injustice because they practice the most expensive prices. And if anyone wants to make a call, we'll have to pay for it mm. because has no choices. So there is no choice in that sort of economy. The same way there is no choice for investors to choose their partners uh, because the system is designed you know, to invest only with those who hold power. And that's why it's possible now for Angolans to go to Portugal because they need to buy legitimacy and they need an entry door to Europe, to the Western world. And they go back to the former colonial master and say, look, sell us your banks and we will launder our money as we please and we will shop here. And just to point out, because I mean, we're talking about economics, but it's, it's an important point, is something you mentioned also earlier today that in your words, this is true, as you said, that Portuguese politicians are kind of in some ways working at the behest of Angles. You said no Portuguese politician isn't in the pocket of, of the Angolan government. Yes, and the commentary in the Portuguese press, usually made by politicians, is that there are 150,000 Portuguese in Angola, and they send huge remittances back to Portugal. Yeah. So it's not the way, other way around as usually Africans yeah. send remittances to, uh, to their, back to their countries. Yeah. It's a European country sending remittances back to, to Europe. And uh, so what Portugal needs to do is to defend those citizens and those businesses and forget about corruption because it does not affect them. Yeah. So there is no, and of course, for a former colonial master, what thought would they have in terms of the rights of the people on the ground. Yeah. You know. I mean, the, the word corruption is a great pivot to Luke, because we're talking about <laughs> Russia here. And, and I, you know, I, you didn't talk about economics so much, but we're going to force you to do that. Now. Sure. Mm -hmm. it, there, is, there is a, uh, you know, we talk about facade capitalism in some of these ways we're talking about crony capitalism and, yeah. and, and corruption. Yeah. I mean, what is the system now? I mean, Don said something about, you know, owning the paper mills. Um, but, we, you know, what, what happens, you know, in the modern world is that the Putin regime gobbles up and, you know, Gazprom-affiliated uh, 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 companies ga gobble up TV stations. I mean, yeah. this is all part of this crony economy in Russia where, you know, Putin's thugs and cronies who own enormous oil, these aren't privately held. I mean, tell us a little bit about how this works in Russia. 
Yeah, I, I mean, one of the reasons I think I was kicked out of Russia was because I, I wrote story about, stories about Putin's personal fortune, and I did a story Which about... Which is estimated at what? Well, six, seven years ago, I, I, I suggested $40 billion, uh, yeah. basically held via... That's a, that's a lot of billions. Yeah, it's a lot of... Yeah, <laughs> uh, kind of the richest man in Europe. And, yeah. and I, I, did, I wrote this story uh, with some trepidation, but based on very good sources inside the Kremlin, and also having spoken to Transparency International and others. Uh, and I phoned the Kremlin 15 times to try and get a response. Uh, there was no response for about three months <laughs> to, to this story. And, and the reason, I think, why is because you have to look at what, what sort of Putin's Russia has become. And it, it, it's become, I think, the, the, the greatest corruption story in human history, not because you know, Putin and his team uh, discovered corruption, but just because the volumes in Russia are so much bigger than everyone else because mm. of uh, oil and gas, Russia being the number one exporter, uh, Gazprom and so on. Um, and, uh, and really what we discovered from, from, from WikiLeaks, I think, is, is um, how Russia has kind of morphed in, into, into, to, into this mafia state, which was the title of, of my book. In other words, that you have... And is, is, by the way, is that drawn from a State Department cable? Uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's, okay. it's drawn from a, a Spanish investigator who's writing about organized crime. And, and what he says, and I agree with it, is that essentially um, you have governments and you have uh, the spy agencies and you have kind of organized criminals and they've morphed into a, into a sort of single entity. So in other words, when you know, Obama or other Western nations are, are dealing with the Russian Federation, in a way, they're not really dealing with a sovereign state, they're dealing with a kind of mafia cartel. Yeah. Um, and, and, and with really the, the, the country run along mafia lines, in other words, you, you need to be loyal, you need to keep your mouth shut, uh, and with, with billions being offshored, I mean, you, you don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to, to work out where this money is. You, you yeah. need to follow football, let's say that, uh, mm. or, or uh, look at yacht marinas, or walk through the streets of West London where you see villas, palaces, all empty, but, but belonging to, to senior, senior Kremlin bureaucrats and oligarchs. And in, in, in incidentally, we should point out, too, that some of those are owned by people who are also oligarchs but that wouldn't play by the Kremlin's rules. And London has become a destination. I mean, for the Kord I, I, well, Kordakovsky's I, I, in prison. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, Leningrad has become time. something of a cliche. But I mean, yeah. I think th th there's this false Kremlin narrative that Putin somehow defeated the oligarchs um, yeah. when he jailed Mikhail Kordakovsky in 2003. He didn't. Basically, he, he and his team took over. I mean, Putin's the kind of uber oligarch in this game. He sits at the top of this pyramid, and yeah. it's impossible to know how much he and his team are worth. But but and it's one I, thing that I've makes seen figures in excess of 300 billion dollars. It's, the, it's yeah. one thing that makes you know horrifying scumbag dictators really angry angry is when, when you talk about this, and you can look at this with Fidel Castro, yeah. when Forbes does this rich list and they, they do an estimate of Castro's wealth, the apoplexy that that induces, the grandma headlines, the lies of the imperialists, and steal, 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 when you pointed out, there are photos recently of, of one of Putin's palaces. Uh, well, that, that's right, and I would just say lastly on that, um, I, I think it was interesting that Bill Browder spoke yesterday, but the thing that really terrifies uh, sort of Kremlin bureaucrats is the idea that they will no longer get a visa for, for the US to be able to go <laughs> skiing in Courchevel yeah. or go shopping in, in, in Knightsbridge in London and yeah. because they regard themselves as part of the kind of globalized elite. And really, this is one of the few levers, I think, that, 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 that the West has in, in dealing with what's just by any standards, a kind of stonkingly kleptocratic regime. Yeah. So, I mean, let's talk about the interesting thing that she was talking about at the end of uh, income inequality mm. in, a, in a place that is referred to as the beacon of economic freedom in a, in a, in a headline. Is it, I, I don't want to say how, do, how does one solve this. It's, a, it's that's sort of too big of a question. But in the, in the case of Russia, I mean, you see the, the glittering Moscow clubs and the, the handbag shops of Prada for, for the Angolan elite. And, you know, we have these sec sections in Caracas for the, for the uh, kleptocrats of, the, of, of Chavismo. Um, but you get outside, and uh, outside of these places, and you know, in Patare and Caracas, and, I, and you, we were talking about this, these you know, R rural Russia, rural basically. Russia, yeah, where yeah. there's no roads. Yeah. So I mean, this narrative of, of, of growth is not the same narrative as economic freedom. Obviously, there's a big difference there. How does how does one kind of shake that and, and sort of? I mean, it, it, you can't in a place like Angola, for instance, can you? It's possible. It is possible. How, well, possible. tell us how. We'd love to know. I, I think <laughs> the, the main point is that uh, these dictators, these kleptocracies, make corruption look cool, uh, as a Nigerian friend said. And uh, once they sport their baga, uh, Prada bags, and um, they look great and very venerable. And what is important is also to show the other side of coolness, which are those who are fighting against corruption and essentially also demonstrate locally what the consequences are of that kind of extravagant lives. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, just recently, I wrote an article denouncing an official that spent $250,000 just on champagne cristal for his party. This seems to be a theme, by the way. Yes. $35,000 <laughs> champagne bottle. Exactly. <laughs> and once we start exposing it uh, as uh, acts that really should be reviled, uh, I think they start somehow trying to hide it, mm -hmm. and which makes it more difficult to, uh, in country to have that, because people aspire to that sort of lifestyle. They don't say it is criminal. They say that's what everyone should aspire, and that's why the government freely writes in terms of propaganda that uh, it's fighting successfully against poverty. That's why we now have a female billionaire in the country, mm -hmm. you know, when in fact it's the president's daughter and she has been uh, enriched with presidential decrees. And you, so, I mean, ex exposing that information exactly. in, in, in your country is rather difficult. Obviously, because you know you don't. There's one opposition paper that doesn't even really count as an opposition paper, correct? Yes, but uh, that's why we have to find creative ways of uh, continuing to uh, create, generate more pressure. For instance, the picture that was shown mm. of a green uh, palace perched on a hill with slums. That's the president's private house. Yeah, and there's slums everywhere around it. So once that becomes, some young people pick that picture and twisted the government's propaganda that the government is doing. And uh, they sort of uh, remodeled it and say, well, the government is undoing, look at it. And it starts to have an impact. And uh, so that's why, for instance, internet has become the last frontier of debate yeah. in Angola because the government controls the press. But uh, as of 2011, the government tried to pass a new bill to regulate internet in which no one was, would be allowed to post a picture or send an email <laughs> referring to a third person without a written consent of that third person. <laughs> oh, dear God. Just, just to, I mean, I think your question is a very interesting one, but I, I think it's, there's a sort of paradox about what's happened in Russia over the last 10 years. In other words, the middle class has, has, has grown under Putin yeah. considerably. People have actually got, got wealthy not because Putin is some kind of fiscal magician, but because the oil price has, has spiked and gone up and yeah. up and up. But, but the curious thing is, is, is the same middle classes who are almost the beneficiaries of this who've been demonstrating in the biggest numbers on the streets of Moscow and St. Petersburg since the collapse of the Soviet Union. In other words, it, it's these people who no longer want the kind of feudal deal they were offered early on by Putin, which was, you know, you give up your political rights, but you get a fast broadband sure. connection, a holiday in Turkey, and so on. And, and so, so there is, I think there is some grounds for optimism that as levels rise, you know, this can catalyze political processes. And in, in some of the grounds for op optimism would be a collapse in oil prices, correct? I mean, this is the same thing, again, to reference again Venezuela, is that, you know, a, a, a Potemkin economy being uh, propped up by very, very high oil prices. Yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. When you talk about, about uh, political change, yeah. uh, a lot of times we, we think of political change in terms of campaigns and, and movements. Um, but behind those campaigns and movements are individuals uh, with, with, with lives, with, with families. And, and unfortunately, it still takes these individuals to uh, really begin to, to start these movements. And um, unfortunately, it, it, it's, it's, that's... Has, it still has to be the way, and of course we're going to be able to employ these, these uh, new tools, the internet, um, but that makes a very strong case for forums such as these, where people can come together and share their experiences and don't have to feel so isolated all the time, because when we return to your own, own, own countries, uh, very often you're just going through the daily grind of having to, to, to strategize, plan, and, and, and eventually get in trouble with the, the authorities. So, it's very important when, when people begin to know some of these, these personal accounts mm. behind some of these movements. But I, I'm just not sure that the inter internet is necessarily the kind of force for political change that we'd hope. I mean, certainly it's one dynamic, but also I think the regimes like Russia, like China, uh, I guess Angola too, um, have become very adept at employing bloggers, hiring you know, people to kind of flood the zone, to astrozerf comment pages. I mean, I currently have 34 uh, Twitter clones that uh, look like me, have my photo and bio, but are, are tweeting kind of yeah. Kremlin press releases. So please, so, please by the way, follow all of them. They're yeah, very yeah. interesting. I mean, they're very interesting yeah. if you want to know, <laughs> you know, 
uh, President yeah. Putin meeting the you know, foreign minister of Azerbaijan, Wrestling you know, and something. yeah, whatever, <laughs> uh, fishing with no top on. But 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 seriously, I think I think that there's sometimes this sort of false liberal idea that the internet will will overthrow these regimes, and of course they're fighting back. They're they're, they're ad adaptive. They're they're postmodern, and in in Russia's case, they have unlimited resources to to broadcast yeah. their propaganda, to found TV stations like Russia Today, and to kind of to take the fights to those who who would seek to overthrow them. If everyone doesn't know of Russia Today, which goes now by the acronym of RT, much more sort of benign, it is an English language, now Spanish language also. A comedy channel. You're basically a comedy <laughs> channel of conspiracy theorists and lunatics who um, occupy the airwaves and, and uh, broadcast straight Kremlin propaganda into homes across Europe and, and, and now quite heavily in America and the, online. The, 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 the idea is to convince the West that their countries are as rubbish as Russia, basically. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that's the goal. The, the, and I have to yeah. say, the strange thing about this yeah. is that they've done a very good job. The, 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 the material is, is, is idiotic. But it does have this thing of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It's a sort of counterweight to American Western power. And it has been reasonably successful. So. Yeah, I, I get the Washington Post. And I don't know if it's the same deal, but every now and then there is this a uh, fold-in section of the post Russia. that uh, about Russia. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. and you know, I, it's it's just garbage. Um, yeah. It's it's paid for by the Kremlin. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. no it's, doubt. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, but it it points out something that that I, I think is well, that reminds me of something I think is worth pointing out. Uh, those inserts go on and on about how wonderful Russia is for business. It's a great place to invest, yes. right? And it's important to keep in mind that economic freedom. Uh, should not be confused with what is best for business. Yes. Uh, business is a means to prosperity. It is not the goal of economic freedom. Uh, 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 and so regimes that set out to promote business are not the same things as, re as regimes that set out to promote economic freedom. And regimes that set out to promote business as such will not, in fact, promote long-term sustainable economic growth. In Singapore being the, probably the starkest yeah. example of this. You know. But no, I mean, I, this is the, the, the propaganda thing, and, and to Luke's point on, on, on media, and you know, all of this is ultimately about economics, I mean, the underlying theme of, of much of this stuff. And it gets, so, it gets so difficult for authoritarian regimes that aren't very good at pivoting. The Russians are fantastic at this, mm. the Chinese are fantastic mm. at this, hacking. Um, by the way, it just reminded me, you were hacked. Yes. Let, I mean, you were hacked, and you discovered that you were hacked at this conference. Yes. From one of these incredibly My clever... Jake. <laughs> There's the clever... Oh, hell. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a round of applause for you, and I need you to check my computer later. So, uh, tell, tell, us, tell us a little bit about that. It's a fascinating story. Uh, it, it's just uh, I felt that my computer was having uh, some problems because <laughs> I kept people replying to me asking for more documents and more information. And I would say, well, but I've already sent it. So I was essentially sending it to someone who had taken over my computer, and Jake was able to trace it all the way to India. Uh, but what was important to me was to know that the government had, or whoever did it, had gone to such length yeah. uh, to really control me. Because again, as I said, the internet has become that last frontier. Mm. It's not. It's just a means, it's not a goal, it's not what will revolutionize. Uh, but when people have no other outlets, and that's a cheap resource because you have a connection, it's good enough, you can upload material. And the importance of it, it's also the message that is put across. And one example I will give, for instance, when I mention these young people and what they do with the demonstrations and how they post uh, their materials on the internet, led the former guards of the presidential guard to seek them uh, for, uh, to couch them on a protest, coach them to protest. Mm. Uh, in, uh, so in last year in May, actually the former presidential guards were supposed to go out on a protest. And the, the two leading youth who were li uh, strategizing with them were kidnapped and are feared dead to this day. Uh, so it's just to show how the impact of it is essentially to raise awareness uh, when newspapers do not reach, when radio is controlled, which is usually the best means of communication in, in Africa. But the internet also has a very small outreach. And what is important is the word of mouth. What is important is the information needs to be stored somewhere. 
that people can take and distribute around. Mm. And so to help plan and strategize. And that can only work if people have the right information on the reality of the country, on what is happening. I mean, I, I do think that the, the Russian system is very interesting insofar mm -hmm. as it's, it really is um, a sort of postmodern system of control. So certainly in the early Putin years, you had, um, you know, TV is, is strictly censored by the state. So the first 10 minutes are Putin fishing or, you know, hang gliding with cranes yeah. or, or, or wrestling polar bears. Um, but the internet was free. So <laughs> in, in, in other words, you had censorship for the masses, but you had freedom for the intelligentsia. And th that, I think, is, is why, why regimes like Russia are in a way, so formidable is because, because they're adaptive. And I think Putin realizes you don't have to control everything anymore. Um, you can let private space be private space. You have to control political space. Um, but, but where this is, is, is coming undone, certainly in Russia, is the internet penetration has taken off and off and off. And, and uh, that, that model, I think, is now bust. And at the moment, none of his many kind of strategists have come up with a new model to kind of ha have sort of semi-censorship, if you like. And I mean, this, this sort of gap enormous yawning gap between rich and poor in countries uh, helps with political control. I mean, as, as you said, it, it becomes something for the intelligentsia. I was debating somebody um, after the death of... Uh, of no, <laughs> that didn't happen. Uh, after the death of Hugo Chavez. And we were talking about media consolidation in Venezuela, and this guy was uh, quite a fan of, uh, of Chavismo. And he said, well, no, you know, th th there are private channels. You have to understand this. And, but, of course, the trick to that is they're all on cable. So you don't, I mean, public, on the mm -hmm. public airwaves is, you know, controlled by, by Chavez, and they're diminishing any opposition, um, and the last TV network has now basically been taken over. And so you have, you have this thing. It's like where on the Internet is the thing for in, 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 in poorer countries, in countries where there's a big gap for rich and poor, that free information isn't even available. Correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is. I mean, and it, what is the what is the case for this? For instance, in a, in a country like Singapore, what is the media climate when we always hear about the economic climate? You know, you're free to air channels. That's completely controlled by the government. Every TV station, every radio station, every newspaper um, that someone like me grew up uh, yeah. reading, they're all controlled by by the government. What you have then is a bit more of a free play of the cable. But then again, that's all entertainment anyway. Sure. It's where I think the, the internet uh, comes in very handily um, when activists uh, are using and capitalize on, uh, capitalizing on it and trying to disseminate the information. I, I think that that uh, um, has driven um, the political content as well and uh, the, the government media, the state media, mm. has found it necessary and in certain cases to play catch up. Uh, the last elections that we had in 2011 um, had ma managed to broadcast very much of what um, some of the opposition parties and, and uh, of what they were saying. And hitherto, that was not available uh, mm. to the people. And uh, that, that's, it, it's been, been very useful. I, I'm not sure about the Russian model, but for Singapore, it's, it's, yeah. it's been a, a tremendous help. Yeah, yeah. And to, to, Don's, to Don's point in, in his presentation quickly, is that controlling, <laughs> it's controlling the means of media production in a way, is that, you know, Singapore is, is a wonderful place, a fantastic place for business. Could a business that decided they wanted to start like a, a media mogul, who, it's business, they wanted to come and start an opposition newspaper because he thought there was a hunger for it. That couldn't happen, could it? Well, uh, under the law, you, you're not, uh, no one is allowed to, to own a newspaper without government permission, yes. and, and um, that's a no-brainer. As far as if anybody wants to, to apply for a license, uh, that um, I don't think anybody's tried, but um, the, the, the conventional thinking is that they won't be um, allowed. So you still have the, this problem. Sure. But people are on themselves, by, by themselves, coming up with a lot of blogs and, and, and web websites, so that has, uh, has driven mm -hmm. political information somewhat. And, and in Russia, how this, how this happens is, you know, the free economy is people, is people being squeezed out, right? I mean, political control being exerted not in the old sort of Soviet way where you'd be hauled off to Lubyanka, but in a, in, in a more subtle way, correct? Well, I mean, it, I mean, I wouldn't say it's subtle. I mean, if you look at Alexei Navalny... More subtle than that. Well, <laughs> if you look at Alexei Navalny, who's, who's the leading kind of anti-corruption campaigner and blogger in Russia, and I think I would say it's probably the, the, the closest thing the Russian opposition has to a kind of national leader, a national figure who's led these various demonstrations. He's now on, 
on trial in provincial Russia for stealing timber. Everybody understands that this case is kind of uh, ridiculous, but nonetheless... I'm sorry, for stealing timber. timber. Yeah, he stole a whole lot of timber, allegedly. I mean, it, it's not a serious... And what did he do with this timber? I, I'm not sure. Maybe he made matchsticks or something, but I, I, have, I haven't read the... But, but, they, but can't I, even, they can't even I, be convincing I, anymore, but, can they? No, but I think that's... <laughs> or try. That, I, I, seriously, I think that's part of the point. In other words, the, 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 the show trial is so incompetent, yeah. is demonstrative. It's to say that if you challenge state power, uh, we, we will erect this ludicrous case against you and you will go to jail for 10 years. And uh, sadly, I think this is probably what will happen to uh, Navalny. So, um, he, he, I mean, that, that's for encourage les autres to, to, to deter other people from doing a similar thing. Um, at the same time, you get people um, uh, arrested. And the, the other key thing is emigration. In other words, because the system in Russia is so frustrating, you get bright, talented, talented people are, you know, under 40 who decide there's no prospect of political change, mm -hmm. let's leave. It's not the Soviet Union. There's no, they can get visas and they will begin great careers, creative careers in the US or in London or somewhere else. And this is another very good safety valve for the regime yeah. um, to let, let dissenting people out. They, they, they let them out, they go to London, and basically no one pays and sure, too much and that, attention that, that, to that's someone else who won't be protesting anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I want to thank all of you guys. We are, we are just out of time. Um, and I want to thank all of you for, for uh, fantastic presentations. Read their stuff. Follow the links that are on the Oslo Freedom uh, Forum website. And buy the various books that all of these guys uh, have produced. And thank you guys very much for paying attention. <laughs>